Okay, this morning we're going to talk about unscriptural Bible universities. Oh boy, another controversial sermon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen to the whole thing. Consider the scriptures that are being read. Consider the arguments. I know tradition oftentimes rules over top of scripture. People are familiar with something that's been established for a long time, and so they don't question it. But uh, if you're a Christian, you need to have your standard as the Bible, King James Bible, for English-speaking Christians. Uh, and that's really what you should be basing things on, not on your traditions. Okay, now it's kind of interesting because this sermon was originally called Unscriptural Bible Colleges. But upon looking at uh, the Bible, I actually found out that that's not a correct title. So that's why I changed it to Unscriptural Bible Universities. Um, the fact is the college, the word college, appears two times in the King James Bible. We're going to look at those. But uh, how many times does university appear? Zero. How many times does seminary appear? Zero. Institute? Zero. What about college? Well, we're going to look at that. Uh, the first reference, we're not going to turn there. You can actually turn to Second Chronicles chapter 34. That's where the second occurrence is. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verse 21. Uh, but the first one is in Second Kings chapter 22 verse 14. And it's basically the same thing that's going on here in Chronicles. Um, but it's interesting. It says, So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Achbor and Shaphan and Asahiah went unto Huda the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. Okay, so that's the first reference there. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. There was a college in Jerusalem? And now what the image that comes into your mind, of course, is some big building. You know, Bible college with a bunch of professors walking around in robes or something. That wasn't what it was. If you look in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, the definition of college is, uh, in its primary sense, a collection or assembly. Hmm. So the first definition of the word college is assembly. We're going to get back to that in just a couple minutes here. Uh, verse 21, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 21 says, and you're going to see a lot of times when you read the Old Testament, this is one of the important things about reading the Old Testament, that a lot of what went on back then just repeats itself down through history, and it repeats itself today. But it says here, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. Is that true of America today? Yes. Yeah. You go back 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, and a lot of the preachers were starting to really kick into this thing of, well, the Greek text says the King James Bible is not as accurate and they started to question the words of the book that's before you. God's never going to bless a ministry that does that, by the way. Verse 22, And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Hulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikvath, the son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spake to her to that effect. Now I just want to point something out here real quick before we continue on. You probably aren't going to pick up on this unless you actually have the two verses before you. But here in verse 22, in Second Chronicles, it says, Tikvath. There's a T there, you know, between the A-T-H, in other words. Second Kings chapter 22, verse 14, it's Tikva. There's no T-H, it's just an H. And then it says, the son of Hazra. In Second Kings, it's the son of Harhas. Now, what happens is people that are in the universities and they want to find fault with the King James Bible, they'll say, see, right there is a contradiction. And it looks like it is a contradiction. But let me just say this. 
I have a video by a man named William Schneblin. And I have a book that's written by Bill Schneblin. You say, oh, that's two different people. No, it's the same guy, but his name is different. You can say it either as Bill or as William. And there are a number of different names out there that are like that that can be said different ways. You know? So what do we have here? Is this a contradiction? No. It's just two different ways to say the same name. That's all it is. But see, it's how you approach the Bible. It's back there in verse 21. You know, people that have a sin problem and want to get rid of final authority, they'll look at things like this and they won't say, oh, it's just clearly two, the same name spelled two different ways. They won't come to it. They won't approach the Bible that way. They'll say it's a contradiction. Therefore, you can reject the whole book. And there are people that are like that. They find two different ways that names are spelled. The same name is spelled. And they reject the whole book based on one supposed error. And it's not even an error. See? Okay. Uh, we're going to get back to some of that in just a little bit here. But uh, look at verse 23. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place, and shall not be quenched. Did you know God's wrath is coming to America? You want to know why? Well, I made mention of it last week in my sermon about unscriptural church buildings. But the fact is, two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, um, in June it would have been, 50 churches, 50 prominent church buildings, excuse me, they're not churches, but uh, according to the Bible, but 50 prominent church buildings here in America read from the Koran. What were they doing? They were burning incense to other gods. They're reading a false, corrupt uh, set of book, basically. I, was, I don't even want to call it scriptures. But they were reading a false book written by a sex pervert, Muhammad. That's what's going on in America right now. And you think God's going to put up with it? No. You say, well, what are we going to do? Well, listen to Jesse's messages on the benefits of living in a nation that God's judging. <laughs> That's what you can do about it. But you see here, the whole point I want to make here is that there, the word college is in the Bible, and it means an assembly. Okay, I want to read a quote here, and uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about the guy that said this, but it's a good quote, and... Uh, I'll just read it here. It says, I am afraid that the schools will prove the very gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the holy scriptures and engraving them in the heart of the youth. Now, the man that said that is Martin Luther. Okay? And I have a brother over in Sweden that has been very uh, lovingly but strongly rebuking me on the issue of Martin Luther uh, because his country in Sweden is mostly Lutheran. And he was raised Lutheran. And he's been in the Lutheran church and he knows what it's like over there. And he, his contention is that Luther was not a saved man. And he has some very strong arguments. And uh, so I'm not going to say Luther was a saved man because I can't really say it. According to today's standards, there's no way. Okay? The different things that he stood for and whatever else, he wasn't saved. Now, I try to have grace for him because he was back in years where there wasn't a lot of information available. But I'll just say this. Whether or not Martin Luther was saved, the statement that he made there, that the schools will be the gates of hell unless the scriptures are taught, that's truth. So whether or not the man was saved is irrelevant. Okay, That's as far as this statement is concerned. That statement's true. If you don't hold the Bible as your standard, it becomes the gates of hell. And we see that today with a lot of the seminaries. The seminaries today here in America are teaching heresy and they're cranking out some of the worst apostates out there. Get back to that in just a little bit. But 
If you remember, I said here, the college is an assembly. That's what the word means. A college is an assembly. Now, in your New Testament, what does the word church mean? It means an assembly. Specifically, a called out assembly. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to get back to that in towards the end of the sermon here. What a college should be. Okay. If you want to have a Bible college. But now we're going to go to um, the book of Daniel. We're going to look at what education is supposed to be, you know, quote unquote education. What is it supposed to be in the Bible? Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. And of course, if you know the story here, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the king of the very first one world government, the head of gold, he has a dream and none of his wise men can interpret it. But it says here in verse 19, uh, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth, removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made unto me, and hast made known unto me how now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Where does wisdom come from? God. Okay, if you remember in your New Testament, I think it's John chapter eight, Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. Don't go to Satan for education. You're going to get the wrong kind of education. Okay, true education comes from God alone. Now jump down to verse 27 there. Okay, it says here, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And he goes on to tell him what it means. But I want you to look there at verse 27. Notice there the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers. They couldn't figure it out. Now, did would these men have been considered highly educated by the people. Yeah. Under Nebuchadnezzar's reign, you didn't make it to be a wise man um, just by being a con artist. <laughs> okay? If you did that kind of thing, he'd have killed you. <laughs> you know, he required that you had some level of intelligence. And he would go out into the different countries and he would pick the very best and brightest from these different countries and he'd say, okay, you're going to serve me. Well, I don't know if I want to. Okay, die. <laughs> you know, you didn't have a choice. But you see there, worldly education doesn't mean anything. True understanding and true wisdom come from God and God alone. Now we're going to go to Luke chapter 24 in your New Testament. Luke chapter 24. Verse 45 that we're going to read. This is, of course, after the resurrection. Jesus meets with the uh, disciples. And it says here, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You know, one of the things, the, probably the biggest attack that you'll hear on the King James Bible is, I just can't understand it. You know why you can't understand it? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You can't understand this book with your flesh. You can't. It's contrary to your flesh. You have to have the Lord open your understanding. 
That's where it comes from. And I can guarantee you, if you can't understand the King James Bible, it's because you have a sin problem. How do you know that? How can you say that? Because I speak from experience. I speak back when I was apostate, back when I was not right with God, I couldn't understand the book. And I'd hear somebody speak from it. The very first one, really, I heard really preaching from it and really doing a good job was uh, Dr. Kent Hovind. And he'd read it, and it was just like, huh? You know, it was so contrary to the way I was used to hearing things. Why? Because I was in sin. The Lord hadn't opened my understanding yet. And that's why a lot of people say, I can't understand the King James Bible. Yeah, because you're in sin. I guarantee it. You get your sins fixed up, and you approach the King James Bible with a believing spirit, God will reveal things to you out of this book that will blow your mind. Okay? Amen. True education. Now go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 5. Here's another key to understanding Scripture. James 1 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I wonder how many seminaries... How many of the people that enter seminaries, I wonder how many of them are asking God for wisdom. Or if they're just saying, well, I'm called into ministry, so I'm going to go off to my Bible college. Or some of them, they aren't even called into ministry. They don't even know what they want to do. It's just the official thing. You go from high school to your Bible college, to your Bible university. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, you go, just go from one right to the other. And you talk to some of these kids out there and you say, Oh, you're going to such and such seminary or whatever. Uh, what do you want to do when you get out? I don't know. Why are you going? If God hasn't placed a call in your life, what are you doing? Well, I go to further my education. Mm -hmm. Did you pray to God? Did you ask God for wisdom? See, they skip that. It's just like, oh, it's the thing that you do. You know, you got to get this education thing or else you can't be used of God. That, that almost sounds like the rest of the world. Yeah, the well, imagine that. Then you go off to, you know, to a university. To a college or, or yeah. yeah. Yeah, it sounds kind of worldly to me. But uh, what's the foundation for true education since we're on that subject? Go back to Job 28.28. 28. Here's a good one to remember. Okay, this is one of the most important scriptures in your entire Bible. And it's an easy reference to remember. You just say, Job 28.28. 28. And if you want to you know, kind of modernize it. Job is spelled the same way as job. So your job as a believer is found in 2828. Okay? It says here, And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So what's the foundation for true education? Fearing God and departing from evil. Guess what? Are you going to have true understanding and true wisdom going to a secular university? No. They don't teach fear of God and they don't teach depart from evil. They teach the exact opposite. They teach that you're not to fear God. In fact, you shouldn't even believe in God. And departing from evil? Oh, come on. You go to college, you go to your university to party and to get drunk and to fornicate your brains out. Okay? Oh, but they have an education. They have a degree. No, they don't. It's a lie. It's a scam. And by the way, right now, I forget the exact amount, but it's in the hundreds of billions. That's billions with a B. Hundreds of billions of dollars of college student loan debt in America. And how many of these kids came out of their college education and now they can't get a job? And they got a $100,000 student loan to pay off. It's crazy. I'll tell you what. It's it's you know there's actually a, a documentary on YouTube which I recommend. It's called the uh, the college conspiracy. Not made by Christians. It's actually made by secular people, and they're saying this thing's a it is a conspiracy. You are being told that you have to go to college as soon as you get out of high school and get yourself in debt. Basically, have a mortgage sized debt, and then you get out and there's no work for you. It's a serious thing. And the church is doing the same thing. We're going to get into that more as we continue here. 
Okay. One other thing I kind of skipped over here. I just want to quote this quick. Genesis chapter 40 verse 8 says, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph, if you remember the story of Joseph, Joseph in Egypt, and Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Okay, interpretations of dreams and wisdom and understanding belongs to God. Okay, now, the two qualifications there I said, uh, fear God, Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Uh, number two, Depart from evil, Proverbs 3, 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And by the way, what's the mentality of a lot of the people that come out of the universities? Are they wise in their own eyes? Yeah. We're going to look at that in just a little bit too. Okay, but the whole thing is, by the very standard of Job chapter 28, verse 28, our secular universities and a lot of the Bible universities cannot produce intelligent people because they don't fear God and they don't depart from evil. Now, what type of men and women does God give true education to? Okay, I don't believe in women pastors. I'm not trying to say that. You should go to seminary and get your degree so you can be a preacher. No. But, you know, I think it's fine for a woman to be educated. But we're going to see what type of men and women does God choose for true education. Best chapter on this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You're going to see here how God does things exactly contrary to the way the world does things. Why? Because the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And the God of this world is not God, it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, it's Satan. Satan has been given dominion over this world right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. It says here, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel with wisdom of words. Is that what it says? No. Not. You say, oh, come on. Leaving one word out doesn't change things. It's not that bad. I just changed the whole meaning of a scripture by leaving one word out. That's why you got to follow along in your Bible. That's why you got to know your Bible. Because you just, just removing one little word, three letters, changes the whole meaning. It says there, not with wisdom of words. Paul was preaching not with wisdom of words. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Okay? When you preach, and you're a true preacher, not a man pleaser like a lot of the cell evangelists, when you are truly preaching, it will look like foolishness to the lost world. Now, if you are seminary educated and you have multiple degrees, you don't like looking like a fool. That's embarrassing. Well, don't you know who I am? I'm the Reverend Doctor. You see how this quote-unquote education, the university education, you see how it's contrary to the Bible? See? Bad news. Jump down to verse 19. It says here, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now think about something. I mean, look at the very first uh, sentence there in verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now, if you want to have the wisdom of the wise, where do you go? If you go up to the average person walking down the street and you say, I want to be wise, I want to, I want to see the wisdom of the wise, where should I go? What are they going to tell you? University. The university, the seminary. God said he's going to destroy it. Now, if God said, hey, see that spot out there in the field, that little grassy area there? Yeah, I'm going to destroy that. Would you say, you know what, I think I'm going to walk over there and stand in that grassy spot. <laughs> no, <laughs> You avoid what God says he's going to destroy. So why is it that Christians have, have adopted the ways of the world and have taken the university mindset and brought it in and made it spiritual? And our young people go off to get PhDs and THDs and THMs and everything so they can be scholars. 
when God says, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Bad thing. Okay, jump down to verse 26. It says here, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, or things that are, excuse me. When Jesus Christ came here and he wanted to pick 12 disciples, did he go to the seminaries? Did he go to the rabbis and the doctors of the law and the lawyers? No, he rebuked them. Who did he choose for his disciples? Commercial fishermen, predominantly. Isn't that something? You know why the Lord chooses men like that for ministry? Because one of the best things that you can do is to learn how to use your hands in life. Okay, to learn the practical use of having to work hard and to sweat and toil. That's why a lot of times you'll see God using men that were farmers, raised on farms. God uses soldiers. God uses carpenters, woodworkers. Why? Because they know how things work. They have something that's very, a very rare commodity in America. It's called common sense. Street smarts. You see, somebody that doesn't know how to use their hands, the, you know, Jesus talked about the lawyers about how that they would bind heavy burdens and lay them on men's backs, but they wouldn't raise a finger, essentially. You see, a lot of educated people don't know the first thing about manual labor. They have head knowledge and that's it. That doesn't work as a Christian. And we're going to see that as we continue on here. If all you have is head knowledge, if you're an armchair preacher, that doesn't work. You have to get out and you have to be in the battle. Get in the fray, as they say, you know. Get out there, be shot at. Get some scars on you spiritually. You know, get knocked down a couple times. That's the kind of men that God will use in ministry. God doesn't want men going through some little book thing and little seminary. You know, a lot of these preachers, they can't, the lost can't relate to them. They, they, there's just no because they're just these little you know sweet smelling little boys or something i mean they're they're just they're nothing you know and and they never really amount to anything it's just bad but i'm getting ahead of myself now why did god choose uh these men like that look at verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Do you glory in the Lord when you have a PhD? Or do you glory in yourself? When you go around some of these celebrity Christians that are shipped around from church to church to church and they announce them, Oh, we're so pleased and honored to have Dr. So-and-so here this morning with us. And I've seen some of these debates and things, and they, and they, when they announce their, the two worthy scholars and opponents and stuff, oh, Dr. So-and-so was educated at such and such university, and he has a degree in this and an a honorary degree in that and a doctorate in that and a blah, 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 blah. Are they glorying in the Lord when they do that? You know, I'll tell you right now, I have met very few, quote-unquote, educated, that's a kind of a weird term there, but I've met very few of them that are humble. A lot of these guys that go through the seminaries, you push them hard enough and they will throw education in your face. Well, you didn't go to the seminary, I'm a doctor, you know. I have met very few of them that do not, you know, when they get a PhD or whatever, I know very few preachers that will just say, oh, just call me by my name. I'm pastor so-and-so. They'll say, I'm doctor so-and-so. Now, who's glorying there? Who gets the glory? Man or God? God doesn't get any glory when a preacher calls himself doctor. And by the way, 
we're not going to go to the scripture, but back in Psalm you can read about it, that holy and reverend is his name, talking about God. Reverend is a title for God. You have no business calling yourself reverend as a man, as a sinful creature. You don't call yourself reverend. Or, you know, some of these, you see these wicked liberal apostates, you know, Lutherans and stuff like that, these just liberal nuts. I'm the most reverend. What in the world's the most reverend? You know? Were you higher than God or something? Disgusting. And uh, you can turn to Acts chapter 22. One other point I want to make here. You can actually see this video on YouTube. It's probably still there. Uh, there was a video of Dr. Jack Hiles' church. And he came out and the people just went wild. They were standing up and screaming and yelling and things. And it, I'll never forget that. And I looked at that thing and I thought, that guy is taking glory from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, well, it's a sin. And I don't care who he is. I don't care what good things he said. You know, it's a sin. I'd be scared to death. I mean, look, read your Bible. Back in the book of Acts, people would run up and they'd be bowing down to the you know, apostles and stuff. And they'd say, get up. I'm a man just like you are. Like passions as you. Get up. Don't bow down to me. That should be your reaction as a Christian. You should not let people worship you. Okay, it's fine to have people compliment you and say, I've been blessed by your ministry. Fine. But if they start worshiping you, you rebuke them. Don't let them take glory from the Lord and put it on you. That's a dangerous spot to be in. Why? Because God destroys the wisdom of this world. I want to get ahead of myself here. Now, the question comes up, well, wasn't Paul an educated man? Well, let's look here at Acts chapter 22, verse 1. It says here, Men and brethren, uh, or men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. Hebrew. This is written in Hebrew. Translated into Greek. Won't get into that. Verse 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way, speaking about Christians, unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which uh, were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there ye shall find a seminary, where ye shall go for seven years, and obtain your Ph.D., and after that do some more studies, and obtain a Th.D., and then you shall be ready for ministry." Oh, I'm, oh, no, it doesn't say that there. And there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Hmm. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Paul did have some education there. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel and he was taught. Okay? So there was something to him being educated. We're going to see about this education. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. It was revealed to him? It wasn't taught by man? Look at verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. 
and profited in, in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. What good did Paul's education do for him? His former education, you know, that, that he was taught at the feet of Gamaliel. Did it make him a good man? No. We have this weird uh, belief here in America, you know, the gods of of uh, Americans. I heard uh, Ruckman say this one time. He said, the gods of America, the Trinity, <laughs> is sex, money, and education. That's very true. And people think automatically, so-and-so is educated. They have a doctorate degree, so they must be a good person. They must be intelligent. No, you can be educated in the wrong area. I mean, if a guy memorizes all the editions of Playboy magazine for a year, he has a quote-unquote education, but he's learned the wrong things. You know, doesn't work. Okay, education does not mean that you're somehow above other people. You can be educated the wrong way. Verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Okay? Verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Well, why didn't he go up to the seminary that was started at Jerusalem? Why didn't he go up to the you know, apostles there and, and become, you know, an official. That's not how the Lord wanted it, okay? Paul had to be educated God's way. Look at verse 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. And of the other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. I guess Jesus had brothers. Mary wasn't a perpetual virgin. Yeah. Verse 20, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Well, come on, Paul. You're a big shot. Paul should have come and, you know, when they were bragging about him, he should have stood up and said, <clears throat> Excuse me, I am Dr. Paul. I am here among your midst. Aren't you honored to have me? I'm sure the pleasure is all yours. You know, he should have said that. But he kept his mouth shut. Why? Verse 24, And they glorified God in me. Remember what we just read back there in 1 Corinthians, that no flesh should glory in his presence? Yeah. Paul saw that they were bragging about him and he just sat there and he kept quiet. Why? So that God would get the glory. Now, if you're out there today and you have some kind of a seminary education or whatever, you're a PhD or something like that, you would do well to shut your mouth sometimes. If somebody's referring to, the, to your work and they don't know who you are, just shut up. Let them glorify God on your behalf. Okay? Let God have some of the glory. Don't be a glory hog. Okay? But what was going on there? Why was Paul traveling all over the place? Because he was receiving his education. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't from visiting different seminaries in each of those places and getting degrees and writing theses, reports, and, and, you know, whatever else. That wasn't it. He was going out and he was witnessing and he was preaching and he was being beaten and thrown in jail and everything else. He was getting an education. How do you get an education, a true education as a Christian? On the job training. On the job training, exactly. Hey, you want to know about Calvinism? Well, I better go and get a take a course on it. No. Get a book. Learn it, study it, read it from the Bible, and then go find some Calvinists and talk to them. And see what they believe. Hey, you want to know about Catholics? Study Catholicism. Go out and get a catechism. Go get some Catholic books. Go get a Catholic Bible. See what they believe. And then go talk to some Catholics. Let them scream at you. Let them rip you up. Let them, let them make fun of you. Get laughed at. That's how you get an education. Okay? Not in some cushy little classroom somewhere that you're paying $20,000 a year to go to. 
you know. And all I I learned, I learned my education. I had it in four years or seven years. Wrong. And a lot of these guys, these young men, come out with a head all puffed up, full of knowledge, and they think I am an educated preacher now. No, you're not. You haven't even begun. Okay, your education is going to last your whole life. You're going to be learning. You're going to be studying. And to come out thinking that I've made it now, I have a little paper, and now that qualifies me. Uh, uh-uh. uh no. And a lot of these guys that come out of their Bible university thing, they think that they can't be taught anymore. And you'll see that sometimes. You'll meet these guys, and you try to correct them on something. Oh, that's not true. I, you know, I graduated from such and such a seminary. You know, they're not teachable anymore. See, real, real bad news. Okay, turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. We're going to see Paul here talking about his former education, his formal education, I should say. Verse 3, for we are the... For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee. Do you know Paul was a Pharisee? Uh, Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You could be blameless under the Old Testament law. Why? Because they had different sacrifices for different sins. Now, that might have been a decent system for people that are honest, but you have people that are dishonest, they'll make an abuse of that. Just like the Catholics with their penance. You know, you go out and get drunk and, and fornicate, Saturday night, Sunday morning, you come in for Mass and you do your little confessional to the priest and he says, oh, go put some money in the, you know, thing and your sins are forgiven thee, my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, That doesn't work. (laughs) Okay. But you could have a Catholic today, just like a Jew in the Old Testament, that they could say, I'm blameless because my church told me so. (laughs) You know, I have an indulgence. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. His education didn't mean much anymore. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What a terrible thing to say about his seminary education. His training at the feet of Gamaliel, the great learned doctor Gamaliel. Paul was a big shot. But what did Paul realize his education was? He said it was dung. Why? Because it would have sent him to hell. If the Lord hadn't gotten to Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul would have gone to hell. Just like a Jew today. And I say that with sorrow. I don't say that as a ha 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 Jews going to hell. I don't say that. It's a terrible thing, these poor Jews out there, the Orthodox Jews that are so steeped in their, you know, system, which is contrary to Scripture, you know, they have have rejected Jesus Christ. And if they don't have the knowledge there, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, if they don't obtain that, they'll go to hell. And all their rabbinical traditions and teachings and everything else, it's dung in the sight of God. What a, it's kind of interesting there because the Bible says about all our righteousness are righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> you know, you could probably think of what what I'm doing there. Um, now let's look at some dangers of university education. "Quote unquote." I have education in quotation marks. You can't see that though because you're just listening. Revelation chapter two. Danger number one of going to a university and obtaining an official degree is what I would call elitism. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, to the church of Ephesus. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, you ought to go through the Bible sometime, and you ought to look at every time God says that he hates something, or that this is an abomination. You ought to make a list of that, and then avoid those things. You know, it's kind of like being in the spot where God's going to destroy. God says, I hate that thing over there. Stay away from it. What's a Nicolaitan? Well, if you look it up, uh, the root word thing there, Nico means ruling, laitan, ruling the laity. Basically putting yourself on a pinnacle above everybody else because you have a learned degree. That's a Nicolaitan. And God says he hates it. Look over here at uh, verse 15 and 16. Here you have the church of Pergamos. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What's the sword of the mouth of the Lord? It's what God speaks to you with. Book of Hebrews, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is the sword of God's mouth right here. And guess what these educated elites are going to be judged by? The book. Isn't that something? So, avoid the Nicolaitan thing. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 1. We're going to see about the proper attitude of a pastor. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, written by a commercial fisherman. <laughs> the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Don't be a Nicolaitan. Don't be a lord over God's heritage. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, the best thing that you can do in ministry is to stay humble, to be a servant to all, to not lord over people. Now, yeah, there's respect. There's, a, there's an issue of double honor and everything else of a man that, that labors in the word. You know, if you're newly saved, don't walk into a, a church or among Christians somewhere and go up to the pastor and say, hey, let me tell you some things, you know. No, you need to have some respect for an older man of God that knows the Bible, you know. You need to be respectful. But that older man of God, his purpose is to bring you up to his level. Not to lord over you. Not to say, you know, when he's asked a question, well, that takes a bit of study and blah, 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 and, you know, you need to all, you know, go to the seminary to have an under... No. You should be able to answer anybody. Okay, you write to this ministry, we'll answer you. Okay, we're not going to hold back any kind of wisdom or understanding from you. You know, we'll give you resources. I mean, people that come to this church that are looking for information, we'll give you more than you can handle. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we will give you a lot. And uh, we're not going to turn there, but Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 one of the lusts of the flesh is something called emulation. Now look that up sometime. Emulation is when you exalt yourself above other people. Okay? And you cause yourself to be worshipped. Just like a lot of people with PhDs do. Be careful. Okay, turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. 
And while you're turning there, I'm going to read this. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2 says, Now as touching things uh, offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. <laughs> okay, watch out for that knowledge puffing you up. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Uh, Jesus speaking here to the educated. No servant can serve two masters, for either either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Did you know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were Nicolaitans? You know, if you remember the guy that was that was born blind and Jesus healed him, and he was there being questioned by all these learned doctors in the synagogue, and he he started to correct them, and they stopped him and they said, "Who are you to correct us? Thou wast altogether born in sin." Like they weren't, you know? See, what are they doing? They were lording over the people. And you see that time and time again. People fearing to say anything lest they be cast out of the synagogue. And Jesus Christ had no respect for that and in fact pointed out, out the fact that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. See how it ties in perfectly with what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? God chooses the foolish. He chooses the weak. He doesn't choose the mighty and the noble and the highly educated. You know, if you're young and you're listening to this thing and you're being told that you need to go to a Bible seminary or a university somewhere to learn God's word and to, if you want to make it as a man of God, you're being lied to. Okay? They're actually putting you into a position where God actually will despise you actually hate what you've become. If you become some big puffed up scholar with all kinds of university degrees, God's not going to use you. Okay? It's not going to happen. Now, we're going to go to uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 14. Okay, and uh, you know, here's another thing I've been saying, education, you know, quote unquote education. This is kind of a funny thing here. Uh, look at John chapter 7 verse 14. Now, a bit, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled saying, and th this cracks me up, how knoweth this man letters having never learned? You want to talk about an amazing statement right there. God manifest in the flesh, the source of all truth in the universe, and the people are questioning his education level. He never went to seminary. Was he in your class? No. Does he have a degree? No. Well, then how does he know what he's talking about? And, you know, I'll have people ask me that. What are your qualifications for ministry? I know the book. I'm saved. God's Holy Spirit teaches me things. Oh, but that's not what I meant. I meant, where did you go to seminary? Does it take a seminary education to speak the truth? No, it doesn't. If they question Jesus Christ, are they going to question you? Mm-hmm. Look what's said here. Verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Scripture with Scripture, people. That's how the thing works. Okay? If I say something or if anybody says something, and you go, wait a second. That seems like that verse is being twisted. There's really not any other scriptures to back that up. Hmm. See? 
True scripture, true uh, study, true education requires many hours in this book. Many, many, many hours. And you can go to a seminary and you can be taught total lies and nonsense. Okay? It's just amazing. Uh, and by the way, let me just say a couple things here. Just because you have a degree from a seminary or university or an institute or whatever else, that doesn't prove that God wants you in ministry. Okay? God wants you in some kind of ministry, yeah, but that doesn't mean that you're called. And there are an awful lot of, you know, I heard a thing back in the 60s and 70s that one of the ways that men could get out of going to Vietnam is if they were training to be pastors. Hmm. So you had all these drugged up hippies fornicating, you know, big hairballs, and they they went out and they went to seminary to become pastors so they could get out of going to war. And guess what? Those guys are preachers. Wow, that's hmm. scary. Yeah. That's scary. So the seminaries were filled with lost men who were just trying to do it just to get out of war. And then they went out and then there were the preachers. And a lot of those guys are still preaching in churches. Hmm. hmm. Gee, I wonder if that would produce rotten fruit in a country. Yeah? Look what's going on in the churches of America. Why? Because the seminaries. Okay? <laughs> it's just incredible. All right? Um, and by the way, I just want to say one other thing here. Uh, most modern education is about training students in overcomplicated man-made systems of belief mm -hmm. so that they can become experts and professional debaters. And a lot of this stuff, we were talking about that Bible study the other night. You know, a lot of this stuff that they do, it's just you're overcomplicating the Bible. Yeah. And what they're doing is they want to have debates, official debates. And by the way, that whole system of debating and oration and all this other stuff, it comes from the pagan Greeks. Okay, if you remember back in Acts chapter 17, Paul walked in among those guys. And they had this altar to the unknown God, and they're up there debating this way or that way. And they say, you know, they spent their time in nothing but to hear or tell some new thing. Okay, just like the majority of churches today. It's incredible. But I'm going to read a couple verses here before we continue. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32, on the subject of debate. It says here, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Do you know murder and debate are listed right beside each other? <laughs> hmm. Romans chapter 1, verse 30. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Without understanding, Bob talks about ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. He said, now Brian, you know, you really need to debate some of these new version scholars. Debate is a sin. Okay, it's something that is done by people who God turns over to a reprobate mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, what it, what good would it do to debate anybody? You know, I'm not going to change my beliefs. They're not going to change theirs. Right. You know, hey, well, I don't agree with you and I think I can prove you wrong. Okay, make your own videos. Preach your own sermons. You know, <laughs> it's just stupid. It's a dumb system. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5, we're not going to go there. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. You say, oh, that's not true. This is a contradiction. Another contradiction in the Bible. You know, these men know lots of things. They have high degrees. Yeah, but in God's sight, they know nothing. God does not look at them and say, oh, they're really educated. It says here, but doting about questions and strifes of words, 
whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Remember the Bible said there in Romans chapter 1 that God turned them over to a reprobate mind? And destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. You say, O'Brien, you sure do go over those verses a lot. Yeah, because they're very, very true. And they're written for you as a Christian today in the church age. Okay, another problem of the educational system is man worship. Okay, did you ever hear of Bob Jones University? I'm real sorry for the conservative brethren out there, but naming a university after yourself is quite arrogant. I mean, Brian Denlinger Ministries Incorporated. How does that sound? That's not going to happen. I mean, it's bad, real bad. What about Hiles Anderson College? <laughs> yeah. And you get a lot of the guys who come out of there, they are arrogant. You know, big time. What about Moody? I can guarantee you D.L. Moody, if he saw what that university of his has become, he'd go in there probably with a shotgun. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't be for what that thing has become. What about Fuller Theological Seminary that produced Rick Warren and many of the other worst liberals that have ever walked the planet? You know, named after Charles Fuller. It's bad. You shouldn't be naming things after yourself. And, you know, of course, what happened to these schools? They've all gone down the drain. All right. Fourth problem. A young man must go into debt before he can enter the ministry. Now, I don't believe in debt as a Christian. I mean, there's, you know, we're in a very corrupt system, and if somebody has a house mortgage and whatever else, you know, you can make excuses for it and whatever. I understand, okay? I'm not ripping on you if you have a mortgage. Whatever. I know that things are bad. But the point I'm trying to make is you get out of high school and you really feel a call on your life to go into ministry, and you go off to your Bible seminary and you come out, and, you know, a lot of these guys are married starting to have kids, young families, but they, I'm called into ministry, brother. I got saved. I got to go to my seminary. And they come out twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in debt. And many times more than that. You know? And what's it do? It puts a strain on the marriage. And there have been marriages that have busted up because of that strain. Now, the Bible says that you are to provide for your own, and if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. Now, a man that's in school most of the week, and then when he gets off, he has to go work to try and put food on the table. You're not really doing a good job providing for your own. That's a problem. Okay. Uh, number five, the preacher is educated in four to seven years, and this qualifies him. No, it doesn't. As I stated earlier, it's going to take you a lifetime to learn. Okay. It's kind of interesting, the Waldensians... Uh, the, the believers in northern Italy, they would actually they would actually require their young men to go out for two years as missionaries. And this is back, you know, during the Dark Ages. The fact is that they would go out and they would, you know, they were sending them out to, like, you know, Rome back during the Dark Ages. I mean, you'd get killed and stuff for that. And they'd put these young men out there before they were qualified to preach to the people. You know, that was their seminary education. <laughs> They send them out. Pretty amazing. Brian, did most of them know the books of John and Romans? Didn't they have them memorized? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of times they had whole books memorized. And they would carry little portions of handwritten scripture with them and, and you know, give them to people or whatever. Pretty amazing. Uh, another problem with this whole seminary university system is that many times a lot of churches will not hire anyone unless they are officially ordained, mm -hmm. unless they have their papers. Show me that in Scripture. Yeah. It's not in there. And again, you have your little ordination, you have your little paper, does that qualify you to preach? No. And a lot of these guys are rotten to the core. A lot of them aren't even saved. You know? I heard, I watched a video by uh, Brother Mike Hoggard, and he said he actually went to a Baptist church. Independent Baptist Church. 
and he gave a salvation message and the preacher came forward to get saved. You know, that's the condition we're in in this country. Oh, but he went through seminary and he had a degree. Yeah, and it didn't prove anything. God wasn't even saved. See, head knowledge doesn't cut it. Now, in closing, we're going to go to one other one other place here, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And then we're done. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Read through the books of First and 2 Timothy and you'll see about the, the qualifications for a pastor. Now, how should the church truly educate young men and women? Well, as we read earlier there in the Old Testament, the word college means the assembly. And church also means the assembly. So where should your education come from? The church. Not some huge worldly looking university with a $150,000 art gallery and a million dollar building and 100 acres of land and all the pool, you know, swimming pool and track team and football team and, you know, that junk doesn't have any basis in scripture. Okay? It's a huge monumental waste of God's money. Okay? The young men and women should be taught in their local church. That's where the teaching should be. And if these churches, as I said last week, if the church buildings were doing their job of feeding the flock of God instead of trying to evangelize the lost, the young people would be trained in the things of the Lord. They wouldn't have to go off to some rotten seminary somewhere that the Jesuits took over. Okay? And that's a whole other subject there. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Education is a responsibility of the church, and specifically the pastor of the church. This is where education should come from, right here among the body of believers. Okay? The older teach the younger, and then they teach the next generation. And then they teach the next generation, and you pass it down. Okay? Apostolic succession. True apostolic succession. Not the kind of junk that the Catholics practice. Okay? They pass down their perversion. You know, that's not how it's supposed to be. Now, just a couple more points here, and then we'll close. Question. How many preachers have shipped their young men away to recognize seminaries and universities and had them come back as heretics? I personally know of a few cases of that happening locally here. I talked to a pastor who said about that they sent, there was a church that he knew, a local Baptist church, and they sent one of their young men, he felt called to preach, they sent him to Bob Jones University, he came back a couple years later attacking the King James Bible. Turn out to be a heretic. Now, at the judgment seat of Christ, whose fault is that going to be? The pastor. Bob Jones University is going to answer for a lot. And a lot of these other universities that, that claim they use the King James Bible and they attack it behind closed doors, they're going to answer. But the ones that are really going to answer are the pastors. The pastors are the ones that are supposed to watch over the flock which God has given them. And when they send their young men and young women to seminaries and they come back messed up, it's the pastor's fault. The pastor's going to be held accountable. That's bad. Okay. A couple of things I want to say here. The church is not a money-making scam. Okay. The church should not be to evangelize the lost. The church is for the teaching of the Word of God. And if you're in a church building someplace and you're not being taught the word, get out of it. That's not heresy. Okay? Again, church is not a building. It's a body of believers. And you might go to a church building somewhere with a real, true, legitimate pastor that will feed you the word of God. Don't leave that kind of a church. Yeah. I don't agree with the building thing or whatever, but I'm not going to separate from brethren that have buildings. That's fine as long as the pastor is doing his job. Okay? But pastors out there, if you're listening and you're a pastor, 
you had better be careful before you send off your young people to these seminaries to have them destroyed. You're going to be held accountable for that. Okay? So you say, I want to know the Word of God. I'm a young man or young woman, and I want to study. What do I do? Should I go to some Bible seminary? No, don't waste your money. Don't go there and have your money go to build bigger buildings and to put in fountains at the entrance and marble floors and art galleries and swimming pools and tennis courts. Don't waste your money on that. Okay? You can spend far less and get a better education. I'm going to speak foolishly here for a minute. Okay, I'm going to say some things about myself, and I'm not doing this to brag. I'm just stating some facts. Okay, take this in the right spirit. I have talked to PhDs who know less Bible than I do. Okay, they'll call me uneducated because I don't have a degree, but in reality, I have more education than they do. And again, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying I've talked to these guys and I say, hey, you know, the Bible says this. And, you know, and I start talking about stuff about the Bible or about other issues. And they're going, well, I never heard that before. That's interesting. And I think to myself, you have a Ph.D. and you don't know these things. What was your seminary education all about? The seven years that you spent at your seminary, what were you learning? You know what they were learning? They were learning man-made books with overcomplicated language and Greek and Hebrew. Greek and Hebrew are of little use to you as a Christian. Amen. Okay, if you're in an area where you're going to run into Greek-speaking people, study Greek. If you're in an area where you're going to be talking to Jews, study Hebrew. Otherwise, they're useless. Totally useless. Don't waste your time on it. Okay, I'm not going to learn Chinese. Why? Because we don't have Chinese people in this area. Maybe a visitor or two once in a while. I'm not going to waste my time on Chinese. It's just, it's stupid. And I'm not going to waste my time on Greek or Hebrew. Because I don't run into those people either. <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to try to lord over people. But you say, I want to know God's word. I want to study. What do I do? Number one, you need to fear God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, that means you want to please the Lord. You don't want to please men. Okay, that's how it starts. Number two, depart from evil. Okay, run from sin and the world. If you are conforming to the world and living in sin, God's never going to use you. And the education that you get is just going to lead to your own corruption, your own demise. Okay, you're wasting your time. If you want to live in sin and you want to study and go to some university somewhere, you're wasting your time. Okay, fear God, depart from evil. Number three, ask God for wisdom. Pray to God and ask him for wisdom. Say, Show me the truth. I want to know the truth. And I'm going to use it to bring glory to you. And number four, find older men who believe and do not question the King James Bible. Find ministries of King James Bible believers and learn from them. Why? Well, because of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The things that we have learned were to commit to you. Okay? If some guy uses anything but a King James Bible... I wouldn't listen to him. Plain and simple. His Bible comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Anything but a King James Bible. Don't listen to him. <laughs> it's a corrupt foundation. So that's going to be it for this morning. Watch out for this seminary education conspiracy. That's it. Thank you for listening.